Well, how many are ready to go today? All right, so that's all the announcements. I'm going to get into a new series that we're going to start uh, teaching on this weekend. And, uh, you know, it's Christmas, it's the holidays, and I look at Christmas and the holidays and think no one should have to go through the holidays hurting and miserable, hating, having people that you, you know, you can't forgive, all that kind of stuff. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to teach a, a, just a small, short series, just a couple of weeks long, and I'm going to talk about this subject, Forgive. And we're going to just talk about how important it is to forgive. And I'll just say this to you. Wednesday night, we had a special guest speaker here at the church. Many of you came out and heard Dr. Caroline Leaf. And one of the things that she said was, it actually does something to your brain when you don't forgive. And it actually hurts you. And she got into the science side of it. Um, she's, a, she's a scientist, you know. She got into the science side of how when you don't forgive someone, it attaches whatever it is that they did to you to you and to your brain. And it actually causes you to go backwards and downward versus going forward and getting better in your life. But the moment you forgive someone, it actually causes your brain to release chemicals that actually benefit your life and even cause healing in your life. And so I think forgiveness is an important thing. God knew what he was doing when he put in his word that he wanted us to forgive. So what I did this weekend is I entitled my message, a really crazy name. You know, I was going to entitle it like a Christmas kind of uh, theme, like white Christmas or something like that, you know. But I decided, you know, because how many would like to have a white Christmas? Amen. Not snow, you know, but, but I'm talking about your sins are forgiven, you're white, you're clean, that kind of thing, and that your heart's clear, that, that, that's what I'm talking about. Well, I, I entitled this weekend Angry Birds. How many, how many, I just want to see hands. How many here have ever played Angry Birds? How many have it on your phone or your, you know, your um, smart device? You know, I have it on, I have six of them on, I think my phone, six of them on my iPad. I put them on there for my grandson, Kate. He loves to play them. Then I started playing them and I, I like it. But let me tell you what Angry Birds is all about. And there's a reason why I'm using this title. Angry Birds is all about a bunch of birds that are really mad. And the reason why they're really mad is because some pigs, this is a true story, some pigs stole their eggs, and they're mad at the pigs for stealing their eggs. So check this out. The angry birds are so mad that they become the weapons of destruction to get the eggs back. And you go through each level, and you're using different kinds of birds, and the pigs are hanging. You know, they're hanging behind wood. So if you hit the wood with a bird, you know, you might break it, you might not, you might kill the bird. But the birds injure themselves because they're mad at these pigs. And it reminds me of the way people are. There are people sitting in this room that someone hurt you, someone injured you, and you've become the weapon of destruction. And it sort of reminds me of this, you know, and, and, and I would never do this. I'm sure you would never do it, but it's a great example. It reminds me of a person who thinks, you know what I'm going to do? In order to hurt you, I'm going to stand up here today. And what if I did this today? You'd be like, oh my gosh, Pastor Mike, I was going to do it, but there's too much wood up here and I didn't want the platform to start on fire. But what if I started myself on fire today and thought the reason why I'm doing this is you hurt me. And I'm hoping that while I'm on fire, you die of smoke inhalation. Come on, how silly is it? I mean, you would not do that. You would never do something where you actually are injuring yourself just so you could get even with someone else. But that's what people do who keep unforgiveness in their life. They become angry. They, and, and, and this Angry Birds game is exactly what it's like. They start to injure other people around them. Some people totally innocent. Some people never did anything to them, but they're injuring them because they become a weapon of destruction themselves because they're mad because someone hurt them. So I want to talk today about forgiveness. And if you're here, listen, I know there are people here, you really have been hurt. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address that. I'm going to talk about it. I'm not here to tell you, just get over it. I'm not here to tell you that today. I'm here to tell you that if, if you will listen to what I say and open your heart up, I believe this is a message like you've never heard before on the subject of forgiveness. And all I want to do is challenge you today that before you walk out the door, you will consider forgiving the person you need to forgive. It could be a mom, it could be a dad, it could be an ex-wife, an ex-husband, it could be a brother or a sister, it could be all kinds of different people. I'm just wanting to challenge you today that you will forgive them. So if you're taking notes, you know, we gave you the card that you get every week. And if you're taking notes, I want to ask you this question and you can write it down and then I'm going to answer it. Why do most people struggle with forgiveness? 
That's the question. Why do most people struggle with forgiveness? And I want you to write this down. Number one, we have a wrong understanding of forgiveness. So in other words, here's the deal. If your understanding of forgiveness is not the way the Bible talks about it, and you've made it unrealistic, you'll never do it. And, and, and just hold on with me because I'm going to go right through a bunch of these reasons that I think, and you're going to see what I'm talking about. But most people have made it unrealistic to say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to really actually forgive someone. They've made it an unrealistic thing in their life. The second thing is, um, you know, they don't forgive because they think it's minimizing the seriousness of the offense. Let, let me say this to you. Uh, I, I think sometimes we do this as preachers, you know, um, sometimes we'll make statements like sometimes you just got to get over it. So just get over it. And it makes you feel like well, they're minimizing what happened to me. And I want you to know this. We're not, no, no one is minimizing what happened to you. What happened to you happened. And it's probably serious and it's probably not right. But that doesn't mean you can't forgive. So we're not here today to say, you know what, we're going to minimize what it is and it's not that big of a deal. And there's some people that have been hurt more than you know. Getting hurt, having someone do something to you, it's real. It hurt. The ex-husband that did what he did to you, it hurt. But that doesn't mean you can't forgive. And I know you're thinking, man, there's, I know there's going to be some scary stuff coming up, Pastor. You're going to tell me I got to go to my ex-husband and talk to him and make this all right. I'm actually not going to do that. So, so just be happy. <laughs> Number three. It's not necessarily reconciliation. Let me explain what I mean. You don't have to go to the person who did something to you and say, we need to get this right. Now, I know there are scriptures that talk about if your brother offends, you go to them, you know, all that kind of stuff. But let me, let me explain what I mean. In the norm, that is the norm. But if it's a wife sitting here today that you were abused, your children were beat, you were beat, you got out of a relationship, and you hear a message like this, and you think you have to go back with that man and sit back in that home and be under that kind of stuff again and get beat again, you don't ever have to do that. Listen to this closely. You're welcome. Um, forgiveness. Forgiveness is between you and God. Forgiveness is not between you and the other person. I'll say that one more time. Forgiveness is between you and God. Forgiveness is not about you and the other person. It's about you and God. In other words, God wants you to go ahead and get this right with him. And you just say, man, Father, I forgive him. It's not about you going to the other person saying, you know, we need to get this right. How, how, many, how many would agree with me right now that you've done that before in the past? And most of the time, it never goes well. Four hands. I, I, I know this for a fact. I've done it before. I'm sure you've done it before. It usually isn't well because here's what happens. Anyone ever have this happen? You go to the other person, you deal with the thing, you know, and they finally tell you, okay, I'm sorry, you know, that I did that. And you walk away and you finally got that apology you've been wanting for years. But here's what happens. Anyone ever have this happen? About a week goes by and you're like, you know, I don't, I don't really think they were really sincere in saying that. I, I really don't think they even meant it. And then... And when I think about it, their tone wasn't really that great. And here's the deal about it. I believe without a shadow of a doubt that if you'll just understand this is between you and God, it makes it a lot easier than it's be between you and another person. Number four, it's not forgetting what happened. I'm not sure how this has happened in the life of the church or in the life of Christians, but this is the way most Christians think. If I really forgave someone, I'll forget about it. So let's look up here just for a moment. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever been going through a store or the mall and you saw the person that you thought you forgave, but the moment you see them, the same bad feelings come up on the inside and you think, you think I really must have not forgave them. Now listen to this closely. Forgiveness has nothing to do with feelings. So just because you feel like a certain way when you see them, you know, you feel like, oh, all that stuff came back up. That doesn't mean you didn't forgive them. But here's what people think in the church world. They think real forgiveness is I'll forget. I want you to remember this today. God's the only one that has the ability to forget. You do not have that ability. Oh, and then once you reach a certain age, then you might have that ability. But you, you do not, come on, you do not have, I'm just kidding, right? Um, you do not have the ability to completely forget what someone did to you. 
So I want to tell you a story. I want you to put your pens down and not take notes just for a minute. I want to tell you a story. I, I was listening to a woman preach a while back by the name of Joyce Myers. I want to see hands. How many know who this lady is? Joyce Myers, right? Everybody's heard of Joyce Myers. So Joyce Myers is telling a story at a conference. This conference had, I don't know, 80,000 people. That was just like this huge conference. And she was telling this story, and she said, most of you have heard my story before. How many heard her story before? She's been abused, right? So you heard her story. And she said, most of you have heard my story before. And she said, you know that I was abused, but I've never gotten into a detail that I'm going to get into right now. She said, when I was a little girl... Now, you know, you have to picture Joyce Myers an adult now, so you got to understand, think about a little girl. She said, I was just a little girl, and my, get, my, my father, my dad, began to rape me. And she said, I was raped over 200 times as a child. I'm going to take a side journey for a moment. Okay, so I'm a dad. I have a daughter. Most little girls, you know, I have a little granddaughter right now, and I know she thinks this, I'm sure, about her daddy. Most girls think their dad is their protector. Can you imagine what it would do to a person that their daddy's coming in the room? And she said, I'm not saying I'm making up 200 times. She said, it's over 200, and I have the exact number. I know every time he came in that room and I remember every single thing he did to me every single time he came in. I, I, I can't even fathom that. When my daughter was growing up and, you know, when she was little, I had seven boys in my family. We never had a girl, you know, so here you have this new little girl, you know, and she's my little daughter. And even though we had a son and, you know, you think your, your son can take care of himself, but your daughter, you feel like I'm, this is one, one of my jobs is I'm going to protect you. That's, that's, what a, that's what a man feels. And she said, my dad raped me over 200 times. And she said this, and I was like, wow. She said, just a few years ago, I was in prayer and the Lord spoke to me and he said, I want you to move your mom and dad from where they live. They lived in another town. And how many know sometimes distance is the best thing between that kind of situation and you? Just get away from it. And she said, so my... I called my dad and mom and said, I feel like I'm supposed to buy you a house and you're to move to Fenton, Missouri and be right here in my town. So she did it. Some years, went, I think a couple years went by and she said, my dad never thanked me ever. He's never thanked her. He never told her I was sorry for what I did. He's never done anything. And she said, one day, out of the clear blue, my dad calls me after this few years went by. He calls me and said, I need you to come to my house as soon as you can. So she gets over there. She's not sure what's going to happen of course, you know Joyce now. She'd be whooping on her desk. So they ain't going to be like, he's going to do anything to her, right? So, um, so her dad said, honey, I'm asking you to forgive me. I wasn't man enough to ever say that what I did to you was wrong and hurtful. I want the Jesus that you have. Wow. And he received Jesus with her. She prayed with him right there. She went and took him and got him baptized. And I think within a few days, he went home to be with the Lord. And this is what Joyce Meyer said. Because this, this is one of my points, right? You think you have to forget it. She said, I never forgot what my dad did. She said, but I forgave my dad years before I ever went over and he accepted Christ into his life. Because forgiveness wasn't between me asking my dad, will you please say that you're sorry for what you did? Forgiveness was me just saying, God, I forgive him. And then she said this, this is crazy. And I know this is Joyce, you know, and she's saying this, so not everyone's like this. She said, I can't even say that I would ever want things to be different than they wound up in my life. She said, because the miracle that God did in me through what my dad did to me and what God did to heal it is outstanding. She says, it's the greatest miracle I've ever seen. But how did Joyce Myers ever become the woman she has? You know how she did? Just one day between her and God, she said, God, I forgive my dad. Think about what she was asking for forgiveness for her dad and, and getting her heart right. I forgive my dad for raping me over 200 times. I can't even fathom that. And she did. So some of you are sitting here and thinking, you know, I can still remember what so-and-so did to me. 
you'll never necessarily forget it. I know some of you are here saying, I've been asking God, God, take that out of my brain. Just God, take it away. And that's not necessarily what's ever going to happen. We remember stuff, but you can forgive them. Got quiet in here. Number five, we don't think it's fair. The reason why we don't forgive or we think forgiveness is too hard, we, we don't think it's fair. I'll just say this to you. I would never throw out the fair card to God because if God did what was fair, you and I would be in huge trouble. What if God flashed you the fair card and said, well, I'm not going to forgive you. It's not fair. My son's the one that died. You should have had to die. So don't flash the fair. Listen, forgiveness isn't fair in the sense of I'm forgiving someone for what they did to me. It's not fair they did it to me. I get it. But if God did that to us, we'd be in big trouble. So we just, gotta, we just have to forgive. So here's, here's, here's what I want to talk to you about. Jesus modeled forgiveness better than anyone. And where he modeled it was at the craziest point in his life. And it's found in Luke 23. If you want to go there, you can. Jesus modeled forgiveness here. Luke 23, 33. And it'll be on the screens. It says this, when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Verse 34, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. Now, I'm gonna ask you a question not to minimize what's happened to you because everyone here has had something happen. But don't you think this is pretty crazy? You're on a cross. They're putting nails in your hands. And here's what Jesus says. Father, forgive them. They really don't know what they're doing. I I would venture to say this. Joyce Meyer's dad didn't know what he was doing. I would venture to say this about the man. Someone did something to him critically bad when he was a child and while he was growing up that he would ever do that to his own daughter. Doesn't make it right, doesn't minimize it, but we always know there's a story behind why people do what they do. But Jesus came along and he said, you know what? I'm gonna gonna show you what true forgiveness is. I'm gonna show you how to model it. They're killing me right now. They're putting me on a tree. They're, They're gonna crucify me. God forgive him. How many know that's not easy to do? Notice Jesus didn't get down from the cross and say, let's get this right between us. I need you to say that you're sorry. Jesus didn't do any of that. He just said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing right now. And then I think this is interesting. You don't have to go there. You can write it down if you want. Acts 7 59 through 60, one of Jesus' disciples, Stephen, watch this, verse 59. And as they were stoning Stephen, so Stephen's getting stoned, Jesus getting crucified. He called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knew he was ready to die, verse 60. Falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said that, he fell asleep or he died. So Jesus getting crucified. I don't think we understand this at all. I don't think any, this is not throwing pebbles. This is throwing pretty good sized rocks at a person to kill them. They just, I don't know if you know what stoning was like in that day, but if you go to the Old Testament and read it, there were times they took people out of the city, took them out of the city, and they were just stoning them to death. Sometimes it was kids. I mean, a kid did something, and so in the Old Testament it said, you know, they do this, you need to stone them. Can you imagine that? And they would take their child, and this is what would happen. People would get in a circle around them, and they would just start throwing huge rocks at them. Eventually, the person would drop to the ground. They'd just keep on throwing those rocks till they drop to their knees, until they drop to the ground. they keep on throwing those rocks. they just kill them. Stephen's getting stoned like that right now. He dies right after it. And he says, Lord, don't hold this against these people. So here's, here, I know you're all looking at me like, Seriously? But we have to look at what Jesus modeled and what one of his disciples modeled to understand what we have to model because what we have to model is the exact same thing. If someone has done something to you, you need to go to God and just say, God, I ask you to forgive them. And you know the, 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 the definition of forgiveness is to release it. it. just means to let it go. 
And it doesn't mean you let it go like nonchalantly, like, okay, God, my dad raped me for, you know, 200 times. I release it. That's not really what it's talking about. It's just like, I'm not going to be the one that allows this to put me in a prison in life. If I want to set me free, I'm going to do it by forgiving the other person because what they did to me hurt me very badly, but I'm not going to be living in that the rest of my life. Some of you have a great future ahead of you. Some of you have things that God still wants to do through you in your life. And you've been bound as a prisoner because of someone else doing something to you that has hurt your life. So let me ask you this. We're we're, we're not going to take much longer on this. And I'm going to give you a couple points on what I believe will help you in your life through this forgiveness issue for the rest of your life. But before I get to that, let me ask you this. Why do you think people are struggling so bad with forgiveness? Jesus actually told us why. One day his disciples came to Jesus and they said, Lord, if my brother sinned against me, how many times in a day do I need to forgive him? Everyone familiar with that, right? I mean, this is easy, simple story. Check this out. In Luke 17, Jesus said this, pay attention to yourself, verse three, if your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. That sort of sounds like if your brother does something wrong, go to him and tell him, but watch verse four explains it. If he sins against you seven times in a day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent or, or forgive me, you must forgive him. The apostles said to Jesus, Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you could say to the small berry tree, be rooted up, uh, uprooted and planted to the sea and it would obey you. So check this out. Disciples come to Jesus and say, Jesus, we're hanging out with these other fishermen all day, your disciples. Each of them do stuff to us on a daily basis to irritate us. How many times do we have to keep on forgiving them? Jesus said, well, you know, in one day, seven times. But then Matthew says this. Matthew's version of this says 70 times seven. Come on, math people, 490 times. And then Luke says, in a day. Can I just ask you this question? Everyone look this way. Is there anyone here that has someone that does something to you 490 times in a day? That's like extreme. Why did Jesus have to go so extreme? Here's why. Now, I know some of you are like, honey, it's you. No. Um, (laughs) Listen, he did this so extreme because no one's ever going to have 490 times. He's just telling you, no matter what someone does, you need to just forgive them on it. No matter how many times it is, no matter how many times in a day, you just need to forgive them. But let me side journey it just for a second. I'm not talking to you if you are here and you are a wife or a person that's in a situation where the person is beating you and abusing you and taking advantage of you and hurting you, get out as fast as you can. Do not stay in a situation where someone is abusing you. So I'll make sure you understand that because you might be here thinking, he's saying, I just got to keep forgiving him. So my husband keeps doing it. I keep forgiving him. He keeps doing it. No, no. If he's abusing you or your children, your family's being abused, then take your family out of that situation. Tell that person you need to get help or we're going to be going. But for now, we're not coming back into it till you get fixed. People here think that's a sin. That's not a sin. That's wisdom. God never made you to have to sit in a situation where they keep abusing you. And if you're in that situation, I honestly want to encourage you, you, you need to get help and, and get out of that kind of situation. So here's, here's what I'm going to do, just in, in, in really honestly, I only have three things that I want to talk to you about in closing this up today. I'm going to give you three things that, okay, once I say, I forgive so-and-so. So, so how hard is this? Because Jesus said, Jesus said, hey, you just have to have faith. What is faith? Faith is you just believing and trusting that God will take care of you if you say, I forgive someone, and God will take care of them. Right? That's all it is. You say, well, how's God going to take care of them? Well, not this. Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you and pray for so-and-so that you will kill them. <laughs> Amen. That's not what I'm talking about. But how many know God has a way to deal with that other person? But here's what faith is. Faith is just doing what God said to do. And faith is just saying, God, I forgive so-and-so. I don't necessarily feel like it. I don't have the feelings for it. I I don't feel like this is what I even want to do, but I'm going to do it because you said to do it. That's what faith is. So let me ask you this question. How easy is this? God, forgive my boss. Not God, forgive my boss, for he is a jerk. Not, not that kind of prayer. But God, I just come to you and say, 
forgive my boss. Once you've done that, what do you think the next step should be in your life for the rest of your life when you finally get to the point where you forgive? Number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. You need to pray for them. Write that down. You need to pray for them. You say, pray for them? I had a hard enough time to forgive them. Here's why I, I say it, just, and, and, I, and I'll get into this. Matthew 5, 43 says, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's the way they believed back in that day. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute or hurt you. Pray for them. Listen, this doesn't mean you go get close to them. It doesn't mean you get back in the relationship. It just means you pray for them. So your ex-wife, your ex-husband, your ex-mother-in-law, father-in-law, people that are getting under your skin, people that every time you see them, it's like, oh, if I have to see my ex-wife one more time when I'm dropping those kids off. Instead, you've gone to God already privately and said, God, it's between me and you. I forgive that person. And now what do I do? Every day when I get up, God, I pray for my ex-wife that you just help her. I pray in Jesus' name that you help her come to know you like I've come to know you. You pray for him. Not this. God, I pray that a thousand fleas will come all over their head, swarm them, start eating them alive. Uh, you know, that's not what we're talking about. So you pray for them. I know that might sound crazy, but it's, it's actually something in the Bible and something that I believe God wants you to do. Number two, you bless them. Before you choke, just write it down and let me tell you what this means. Luke, Luke 6, Jesus said this, verse 27, but I tell you who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Romans 12, 14 says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. So bless them. Let's talk about it. How do you bless someone who's done something wrong to you? Here's, here's, here's what it is. And I know you're, you're, you probably think this is something that it's not. See, I, I always thought bless them means, you know, go be nice to them. Make a cake for them. Take it over to their house. Right? How many here have thought that? You know, it's like, be nice to them. Make some brownies and go be kind. The word bless them, the word bless them. We've got to write this down. You'll never want to ever forget this. Bless them means to speak well of. It has nothing to do with an action. It has to do with what you say. Not asking you to bake a cake and go over and tell them, I'm so sorry. None of that. Bless them means this. I have an ex-wife. I have an ex-husband that did something to me. Instead of telling everyone how rotten they are, you say kind things about them. Um, my, my spiritual father, Brother Kenneth Hagan, you know, he's gone home to be with the Lord um, back years ago. He said, sometimes this is difficult. He said, because you could look at someone and say, I don't have anything that I can say good about them. And he says, so sometimes you got to dig. Sometimes you just need to look at them and think, they have nice eyes. <laughs> you know, you just got to find something. They have nice hair, whatever it is. You have to find something you can say positive about them. Guys, you know this as well as I do. It's not going to do any good for you to tear down another person. It doesn't make you a bigger person or a better person. So what do you do? So when someone says to you, hey, I saw your ex-husband, I saw your ex-wife, you just say something kind. That's what this is talking about. Bless them. Not take something over, not do something kind to them. Just say something kind. So I'm supposed to pray for them. I'm supposed to say something kind about them. And thirdly, number three, you're not going to like this one. And I'll have to clarify once I say this. Number three, do good to them. Do good to them. Now, I want you to understand this. Let me clarify it. Then I'm going to read a scripture and we'll be done here. Let me clarify it. If you think doing good is I'm going to ride over to the guy who beat me up my whole life and I'm going to take him something over to his house and say, I just want to do good to you. That's not what I'm talking about. I just have to make sure we clarify this because there are sometimes people sitting in a, a worship experience and they think that's what we're saying and they go back to a situation and they're literally not in our church, thank God, have been people that have been killed by a person because they did this kind of thing. I don't want you to do that. 
You don't have to go over and do anything. Just forgive them from your heart and stay away from them. Some people, it's better distance. More distance you get from them, the better off you'll be. But in the norm, so let's say we're not in that. Let's say we're in the norm. Let's say it's you're here in church and you've been mad for five years at a woman. You come to this church, you're a lady, she's a lady. You both come to this church, but she stole the guy you thought you were going to have and she married him and you've hated this person. Now, I know you might think, well, that's stupid. That's ridiculous. No one would do that. No, there's people sitting right here like that. Smile. Come on, help me out. There are people just like that. that They have some reason like that. It's ridiculous. We've had this for years. I tell this story, and I know sometimes people hear it, and they're probably like, yeah, Pastor, we heard this story over and over. But this story just intrigues me. We went to a church when we first accepted Christ in our life, small little church, and it was a Pentecostal church, you know. And in the church on Sunday nights when they had church, it was sort of like this odd kind of service where they started off with music, and then they would just call on people and say, hey, Mike, why don't you stand and pray? Or, you know, it'd be like, oh, God, I'd I'd be hiding. I'd be like behind people. If people were swaying, I'm like swaying with them so that the guy did not see me, man. It was like, ah, please don't call me. I, I couldn't even talk in front of people. So I was like, yeah, the, uh, I'm supposed to pray right now. I don't know how to pray, so please don't call on me. But during that time, they would open it up sometimes for testimonies. And during this service, and this, remember, the building's small. It's not like this. At the back row of the church was the pastor's wife, and she got up to testify. And if you've been ever in a Pentecostal church, you know, they love doing this, you know. So she got up and said, I just want you to know, you know, sometimes there's organ, you know, that's going on. She's like, she's like, I forgave so-and-so relative tonight during service. I forgave him. During worship, the Lord dealt with my heart. I forgave him. People are like, amen, man, amen. And she continued. I thought, you should have stopped there. Sometimes there should be a period for people, and it's like, don't go on. She said, it's been 20-some years. This is pastor's wife. And I understand pastor's wives could have something and be hurt, whatever. I understand it, but she'd been in church hearing messages you know, for 20 some years, probably longer. And she said, I finally forgave him tonight. You know why? Because she thought forgiveness was hard. That's why it took her so long. She thought it's this really hard thing, but forgiveness works like this, simple. God, I forgive him. Then she went on to say that the lady's been dead for 20 some years. And I thought, <laughs> that's why it intrigued me. I was like, are you serious? You didn't even just go to the funeral and say, I forgive you, you know, while you're in there. (laughs) You know, anything. I won. I'm still alive. You're dead. Whatever. But (laughs) nothing. 20-some years went by. I was like, wow, this is bizarre. So here's, here's, here's all I want to tell you. She thought forgiveness was hard. Forgiveness isn't hard. There's someone right now, during this message, someone came up in your mind. Someone has come up in your mind and you thought, I need to forgive them. And this is how easy it is today. It is not going home and calling them. Not unless the Lord deals with your heart about that. It's not going home and saying, this is so-and-so, I'm forgiving you. What are you saying back? (laughs) Trust me, half the time they won't say the thing you want. So here's all you have to do is today, before you walk out of this building, I'm going to give you an opportunity in a moment. You just need to say, I, for, I forgive him. Here's what Romans says. I'll, I'll read this because we're talking about do good to them. So let me show you what the Bible says. Do not repay, Romans chapter 12, verse 17. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone if it is possible. As far as it depends on you, let at, uh, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends. Everyone say it. Do not take revenge. One more time. Do not take revenge. Ah, revenge is good sometimes. He says, don't take it. Watch this. But leave room for God's wrath. Yes. <laughs> Squish him, God. I mean, this is what he says. He says, he says, um, He says, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I'll repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, listen to what he says. If your enemy is hungry, feed them. Really? Long as it could be a meatball with glass on the inside. (laughs) Feed them? If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Really? 
Now watch what he says. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Oh, well, awesome. <laughs> Lord God, I've always loved charcoal. Um, watch what he says. He says, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Literally, he's not saying you're going to have charcoal burn on his head. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, if you will do good to the person, this is in the norm. We're not talking about those crazy people that have done stuff to you, but in the norm, if you'll just do something good to the person who's hurt you, their heart will melt and they'll usually come back to you and say, man, I'm sorry for what I did to you. Don't expect that because some people will never do that, but just know that God will deal with them. See, they're God's business, not your business. So check this out. The one thought that I want you to walk out of this church with today is found in Ephesians 4, up on the screen. Because I know some of you have been living this life, so here's step one for you before you walk out the building. Get rid of all bitterness. It's Christmas, guys, two weeks from now. Get rid of all bitterness. Let's, let's walk into that season. Get rid of all biz, uh, bitterness. Rage and anger, brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Watch this. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. And I want you to write this last statement down if you have something to write with. Put it on your phone. Do whatever you got to do. They'll put it on the screen. This is what Jesus is saying, and this is what the Word is saying. The forgiven forgive. Just write it down. The forgiven forgive. Here's what I know about you today if you are here and you say, I can't forgive. Here's what I know about you. Two things. If you are here and you say, I cannot forgive my dad. I cannot forgive my mom. I cannot forgive my ex-wife. Here's what I know about you. Number one, you've never experienced forgiveness yourself from God. You haven't had your sins forgiven yet. Or number two, you forgot how God forgave you. Let me say that again. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I cannot forgive. I cannot do it. I can't do it. You have no understanding of what someone did to me. I can't forgive. Here's what I know about you. Number one, you've never experienced God's forgiving power in your life. How he will forgive you of everything. Number two, you forgot how God forgave you. And if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I can't forgive so-and-so. How easy did we make this? God I forgive my mom. So you might be here and you, maybe you're a young, young girl, maybe you're an older lady, and you might say, when my mom and dad got a divorce, I never forgave my dad because I blamed it on him. Maybe today's your day where you just say, God, I forgive my dad. That's it. Don't have to go into any other kind of stuff. You don't have to call your dad and say, hey, dad, did you know back then the reason why I'm treating you like rotten all these years is I never really forgave you because I thought you were the one. And I just wanted you to know today in church, pastor preached a message and I forgave you. Your dad might be like, what? He never knew any of that. You don't have to go tell him. It's between you and God. Maybe you're here and you say, pastor, you think Joyce Meyer's story is crazy? I have a crazy story. And maybe all you have to do is what Joyce did. God I forgive that person. I don't like what they did to me. I'm never going to like what they did to me. You never will. But God, I forgive them. Help me now. That's it. So I want to give you a chance right now. I just want everyone to close their eyes. We're not going to leave you. Just stick with me just for one more moment. Everyone close their eyes just for a moment. Who is it that came to your mind? You know, I know while I was preaching this today and it happened last night too I saw tears running down people's eyes you know their eyes uh, watering you know tears coming down because this 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 affects a lot of people everyone has dealt with this but as your eyes are closed what person came to your mind that you need to forgive and all I want you to do right now is just do this simple thing. Just under your breath, just say, whoever it is, you know, you don't have to, you, just who, you know who it is. God, I forgive them. That's all I want you to do. I want you, before you do anything else today, to just be able to say, God, I forgive them. Just do that. Everybody has a person. Just release it and let it go and say, God, I forgive him today.